Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for being here for this panel. Thanks for being in the last panel. This panel is different than any other panel we've ever done in the history of the Incident Response Forum. It's just talking about the area of attorney-client privilege. Why have a whole panel on that? Because the cases have been everywhere on this issue. It is the number one issue for every single practitioner, every single IT person. You have to understand it. That's the good news is you have to understand it because the bad news is it's pretty much impossible to understand. But this, this group is going to try to help you get there. So let's get right into it. Let me tell you who we've got. Starting out from McDermott is Todd McClelland. And you got to love Todd. Not just because as a partner at McDermott, he counsels on data breach response for a broad range of industries from retail to energy to finance to brick and mortar, but also because prior to his legal career with his mechanical engineering degree, Todd helped design and code industrial control robotics and automation systems. By understanding the technology underlying the cybersecurity and privacy issues he addresses, Todd's value proposition is quite extraordinary, and we could not be more thrilled to have him here today for his four, first form. This crown of credentials where is rare. Todd, thanks for being here today. John, you can introduce me anytime like that. <laughs> Next up is this, this is the Olivia Benson, or I thought maybe the Aria Stark of incident response, my friend Kim Peretti, who co-chairs the privacy, cyber, and data strategy team at Austin and Bird. What makes Kim a real cyber star cyber superstar is not just that she's yet another bona fide pioneer in our field, having broken new ground, she left CSIPS, the computer crime and intellectual property section of the Department of Justice and forged a cyber practice that had barely even existed anywhere until she decided to create it. But it's also that Kim is one of the most important thought leaders in cyber. That's why we wanted her on this panel. Um, she writes about everything. She talks about everything. She's only comfortable, I feel like, when it's groundbreaking and no one else has talked about it. Uh, she recently wrote an article maintaining attorney-client privilege and work product protections over forensic reports in light of Clark Hill, which is going to be one of the cases they talk about. Um, so great to have a true innovator like Kim who paved her own way, and I can't wait to hear your thoughts on this today. So thanks for being here, Kim. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me as always. Excellent. Well, our next speaker has some of the strongest international credentials of anyone speaking today, which adds an important component to this panel. It's not just that Natasha Cohn, who works out of the San Francisco office of Aiken Gump, and open and co-manages their Abu Dhabi office, where she quarterbacks data breaches of multinational conglomerates in retail, healthcare, transportation, energy, technology, very complex, multi-jurisdictional cross-border challenges, we all know what a nightmare international notifications have become and how costly they cost in the millions, often in the tens of millions of dollars. Those are all perfect to understand for this panel. But Natasha has also served as an international arbitrator for disputes before an array of courts and international tribunals in the Middle East, Europe, and North America. We needed someone like Natasha for this panel because privilege issues are not just for US practitioners, they're global. She's comfortable in whatever country a data security incident originates. So great to have Natasha with us today. Thanks, John. You forgot to mention that it's uh, 6 a.m. in California, so the, the sun is rising and shining in my face. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Cal I, everybody's from everywhere. We love that. Well, <laughs> our next panelist um, is a data, data privacy and security expert, Saren Turner, a partner at Latham & Watkins. And what makes Saren ideal for this panel is not just that he cut his teeth as an AUSA in the Southern District of New York, where he also served as lead cybercrime prosecutor. Um, by the way, in a, his prosecutorial caseload included two massive and complex cyber prosecutions. First against Silk Road, the vast online black market for illegal drugs and other contraband. And second against Liberty Reserve, a multi-billion dollar money laundering digital currency service and underground bank for cyber criminals. But it's also been reported that Saren is part of the team at Latham representing Acelion, uh, relating to the string of cyber attacks against law firms, which makes his insights particularly timely and relevant. Uh, of course, he can't talk about any entity that he's representing, but every data security incident raises questions about vendors. It's perhaps one of the biggest issues of today. I, I find it so hard to protect the privilege in that context. So welcome, Saren. Looking forward to hearing from the front lines on this very challenging issue from you. Sure, great to be here. 
Excellent. And then finally, we have the technologist on the panel, Luke Tannery. He's a partner with the global consulting firm Stone Turn and a veteran of the IR firm. And what makes him a cyber expert, Luke, is not just his 20 years of experience helping mammoth organizations mitigate complex cybersecurity, data privacy, data protection risks, but it's also that he's he has certification as a CISO from Carnegie Mellon and his training as a genuine technologist and a certified net, uh, network pen tester, penetration tester, enables him to manage the investigation of a data security incident and also fix it afterwards. Um, and he, so it's really great to have someone with Luke's tech chops, but also understanding tech governance as well. He's even been known to step in as acting CISO amid an incident response. He's great to have in a foxhole defending gets an attack. Welcome Luke, thanks for being here. Thanks, John. I feel like a million bucks after that. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Natasha, you're in California. Let's get this subject going. Take it away. Thanks. Thank you, John. Thanks for that generous introduction. No pressure panel. Um, it's great to be here um, uh, with, with my esteemed all-star panel. Um, I'd like to jump right into the topic. We, we do want this to be a conversation, so please um, ask questions. I'm staring at my moderator um, questions right now, so um, I'll be looking for that throughout the panel. Um, and we talk to general counsels around the world um, about this topic. And as John mentioned, it's extremely important. It's at the top of their list. You know, one, one of the worst moments in a cyber incident is when the forensic report that you took such great care to protect and keep privilege becomes a roadmap for plaintiff's lawyers or for other parties to argue that your security wasn't reasonable or was inadequate. So I thought it was best to sort of start out the panel and um, level set everyone, catch up everyone um, up with the latest case law developments in the U.S. Um, like most things in cyber and privacy these days, this is an evolving area and the case law actually does give us some some instructive guidance. So Kim, let's let's start with you. Um, there have been a number of instructive case law developments involving the attorney-client privilege and the work product doctrine over third-party forensic reports in particular. So can you give us an overview of the recent case law and some of the more practical insights that um, come out of them? Sure, Natasha, happy to set the stage for our further discussion today. So as a brief history, there are approximately, give or take, seven cases directly on point addressing forensic reports in the context of data breach investigations. And the first three, Genesco in 2014, Target in 2015, Experian in 2000, early 2017, were largely favorable in terms of upholding the attorney-client privilege based on the Covell Doctrine and the work product protection because of the, of the because of anticipated litigation test. The first real challenge came later in 2017 with Primera, where a forensic firm had been working with the company to conduct a review of its data management platform. The firm then identified malware, outside counsel was hired, outside counsel amended an existing SOW with the firm and claimed privilege and work product protection for the follow-on work. The court disagreed, finding that the scope of work for the forensic firm did not change after the engagement by counsel and that there was only a change in supervision of the forensic firm from the company to the outside counsel. And therefore, the company was not able to demonstrate that the report was created in anticipation of litigation. And here's the, the, the test for work product would not have been created in substantially similar form, but for the prospect of litigation. So fast forward to December 2019, the first of two cases by magistrate judges in the Eastern District of, of Virginia, Dominion Dentals. In Dominion Dentals, there was actually a three-way engagement in place prior to the breach between the company, the forensic firm, and outside counsel. And then another three-way at the time of the breach. The court analyzed the case under the work product protection, uh, work product doctrine, and found that the driving force behind the report was not litigation, but was business purposes, pointing to the fact that the services in the SOW were identical uh, the services at the time, the SOW at the time of the breach was identical to the earlier breach, the earlier SOW prepared when the company was not facing litigation. And the court also pointed to the fact that the company used the name of the forensic firm to help reassure clients and regulators um, of the adequacy of its investigation in the incident response process, which was not a litigation purpose. 
So that same court in the Eastern District of Virginia later in May 2020 in the CAP 1 decision, with many of, which many of us are very familiar with, got a lot of attention, similarly analyzed a forensic report prepared by a firm under the work product, work product doctrine. Here, the firm and the company had a series of SOWs for incident response work. And then a breach occurred, outside counsel was engaged, engaged the same company, the forensic firm, hired that forensic firm under a statement of work. The court found no work product protection because, and there's a number of items, but among other things, the scope of services was the same in the legal SOW at the time of breach as the previous SOW, the previous retainer that the company had with the firm for IR incident response work. And that original SOW had a retainer and that retainer was used to pay the forensic firm for the, under the new SOW with counsel. And also that the report was broadly shared to regulators, auditors, and members of IT, information security, and cyber. The court found that all of that indicated that the report would have been prepared in substantially the same form, similar form, absent a risk of litigation. And last but not least is the Clark Hill decision by a district court judge just last year in the District of Columbia. Importantly, the court in this case found that the, rep the forensic report was not protected either by att attorney-client privilege or work product protection. Here, again, we had outside counsel hiring a firm, and importantly here, the firm did not have a pre-existing relationship with the case, with the company. But we also had an internal investigation with a diff different cybersecurity vendor, which was led to the existence of a two-track investigation. One they claimed was ordinary course as part of that initial internal investigation, and one was privileged as the result of outside counsel hiring the external firm. The court found that there was no work product protection for the report by the privilege investigator because the report was essentially or really generated on behalf of both vendors as the truth of what happened was shared with members of leadership and IT and used to manage every issue, all the issues arising from the breach. And then we get to attorney client privilege in that case, which is truly startling. The court applied, applied a very narrow re reading of the Covell doctrine and found that the company's true objective in hiring the forensic firm was gleaning the firm's cybersecurity expertise, not in obtaining legal advice. So it is clear in each of these cases that courts are really grappling with whether the post breach investigation report was prepared and or used for ordinary business purposes versus legal or litigation purposes, often concluding that discovering and reporting on how a breach occurred is, is a necessary business function and would be prepared in the absence of litigation. I do note importantly that these cases generally focus on work product protection, likely because the attorney client privilege was probably waived because the report was shared with external parties. And until Clark Hill, there was relatively solid ground for the application of the Covell Doctrine to support an attorney-client privilege finding regarding a forensic report prepared by a firm engaged by outside, outside counsel. So three key elements, and then I'll, then I'll stop. Um, there are three key focus areas I see from all these cases. One is whether there's a pre-existing relationship with a forensic firm. And if so, whether the scope of services remained the same when counsel was engaged to hire the firm, whether there's a true litigation or legal purpose that can be identified in creating the report. And finally, um, whether the extent to which the, the report was shared with internal, external individuals and or groups. So with that, Natasha, hopefully yeah. that was a, a good framework for us to, to facilitate the discussion around these issues. Yes, definitely. Thanks, Kim. I know that was a lot to pack in in just a few minutes um, and a lot to cover. Um, and I think clearly with this latest Clark Hill decision, you know, the courts are continuing to meaningfully look at the structure of an investigation, um, you know, in, in that case, sort of setting up the two track investigation where the investigations weren't um, occurring simultaneously, you know, the court just didn't buy that um, particular argument and didn't feel that that was a, a true two-track investigation. So I think we'll talk a little bit more about that um, soon um, and a little bit later. A number of questions are coming in and I'm going to move to um, Siren here and also Siren in, um, in answering sort of this next question 
Um, I'm going to throw in a few that have already come in on the um, the moderator panel. So, Sarah, you know, you, listening to the direction of the case law and what Kim sort of laid out, and you know, how are you advising clients about the best way to protect a, a vendor's incident report or to protect other incident? Um, response communications. And as part of that, I've got a question that came in and they, um, somebody's asked, um, following the decisions in the Clark Hill and Capital One cases, where and how should remediation recommendations be tracked? Um, I think that's a really important point. Um, <coughs> when it goes to, you know, how we're all handling communications um, as a result of some of these latest case law decisions. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think the sort of fundamental message of the case law is that courts are increasingly focusing on sort of the realities rather than the formalities of the situation and, and looking to, you know, whether this feels like it was done uh, for mediation purposes or whether it feels like it was done to, to help the lawyer advise the company on legal issues. And, and they're obviously taking a, a closer look uh, at that. Um, in terms of how to approach protecting the vendor report. I mean, I think the first question is whether you have one in the first place. I mean, it's, it's, it's not required uh, that you even generate a, a report uh, at all. And it's also not required that you only generate one. You could have one for one purpose and, and one for another purpose. Um, so I, I think first you start off by asking what's needed. Uh, so if, if a report is desired by the company um, for its IT department so that they understand what went wrong and, and what needs to be fixed, then you're going to face an uphill battle in keeping that privilege. It's going to be circulated relatively broad, broadly. Um, and um, you, you're going to have a tough time claiming that it was generated to help the, the lawyer advise the company on legal issues. Uh, so, you know, if, if that's a business need the company has, you, you want to do things like keep it purely factual. You know, the facts aren't privileged to begin with. The facts are discoverable anyway. Keep the report as factual as possible. Have drafts go to uh, the attorney first. Uh, I mean, in, in Primera, for example, I mean, the, 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 the court held that the drafts that were commented by the attorney, those comments would still uh, be privileged. So get legal input before it's disseminated um, to the IR team or the, the IT team. Um, but the final product um, is not likely to be privileged. If on the other hand, you want to report as the lawyer, so that you have a complete factual record of what happened and a, a, a frank and candid analysis of whether there were deviations from the standard of care here. Uh, if you want to know sort of what are the relevant industry standards, if, if those standards had been followed, would, would, would the attack have been prevented? Those are obviously very sensitive legal questions. Um, and you can have a report that is oriented toward those. Uh, you should, you know, that sort of report should be restricted only to counsel. If the company needs to be briefed on those issues, it should be counsel that is briefing them, informed by the report, but you wanna, I think, limit, limit dissemination of the report itself as much as possible. I, I think post-mortem lessons learned analyses are and it's sort of a gray area. That's something IT wants to see, um, but it has litigation risks because it obviously, you know, the opposing party can try to use it to show what the company should have done prior to the incident, despite, uh, protections of rule four or seven. Um, but, you know, again, I, I, I think there you, you want to have counsel involved in the process. Uh, you want to have counsel reviewing um, those recommendations before they're disseminated. And you can frame the recommendations so that they are as neutral as possible, forward looking as possible rather than retrospective. You know, you can frame them not so much about the incident, but here are sort of standalone recommendations having a senior network that you know, we think it would, would uh, help you bolster your security, as opposed to you should have done this or you should have done that ahead of time. You're just saying prospectively, here, here are some recommendations as to how you can strengthen your system. Um, again, uh, you know, that sort of document, given that it's gonna be probably widely disseminated among IT, you're gonna have a, a uphill battle keeping it privileged, but at least you're protecting it from you know, being used uh, in, in a way uh, that could be directly harmful to your litigation. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And I, mean, I, I, I really like the recommendation on um, the security recommendations. Um, you know, that is a concern 
um, you know, clients are kind of throwing up their hands and say, well, don't, don't send me reports. Don't, um, don't write down the security recommendations for the idea that, um, you know, some of these recommendations could be forward looking. Um, one has to wonder if, you know, um, in litigation, you know, the plaintiffs will sort of imply that, um, you know, a forward looking recommendation might still get you in trouble, but that's definitely something I think we'll continue to debate for a while. Um, we're moving, Todd, let's move a little bit uh, to you. Um, a lot of questions are coming in. I almost can't keep up, uh, but bring them in. Um, and I just want to kind of get a little bit even more into the specifics here. Um, I have several questions about what Kim mentioned and um, the, the SOW and, and whether and how to kind of update that scope of engagement or, you know, do you want to keep that um, forensic firm on retainer beforehand? Um, you know, can you talk more and more about what you're seeing and whether your clients are um, refusing a report and, and also while you're at it, not that this is, you know, <laughs> you don't have much on your plate, talk a little bit also about when you advise clients to actually set up a, a two-track investigation and how insurance companies and others might react, um, you know, in um, setting up, you know, retaining two forensic firms and um, doing parallel investigations. So a lot on your plate there, please. A lot on you. my plate, indeed. <laughs> Let's talk about some of these things. First, on kind of the strategies you were talking about. First, let's not forget the basic blocking and tackling here, which is just limiting the overall communications back and forth with communications. And, you know, typical kind of you first get in, limit communications internally, uh, make sure counsel's being copied, you know, the basic stuff. And we can't forget that and overlook that. And that's really one of the first steps that we were looking at when we first get engaged. And then that, of course, leads to any kind of involvement by forensics. We want to make sure that counsel is really leading the investigation, and it's got to be documented as much. You know, those little emails you send, would you please talk to so-and-so or engage with so-and-so or whatever, let's make sure we're doing that. And that's often, thing, you know, those are kind of things that often get overlooked. Uh, we also want to make sure we're, you know, storing evidence. We want to make sure that we prevent one of those kind of substantial needs arguments. There's a famous footnote in Capital One about this, and making sure we're storing server images, event logs, network diagrams, all the stuff that goes into the forensics report, we want to make sure that same evidence is available. Um, you know, on the report, Saren did a great job. Sorry, I've got a friend. Um, we want to make sure, you know, we talk about it having additional reports, and that's exactly right. One of the things I start to have concerns about with additional reports is, you know, are we, are we dealing, are we starting to tread into the issues or creating issues of subject matter waiver? Uh, and that's where I really get concerned. We all get pressure internally and externally to make the forensics provider available, whether it's by phone or make a report available. And we've got to be very mindful as we do that of potential subject matter waiver. And, and I like the way that, you know, the way that Kim teed up the issues of kind of the, the, the because of test uh, when it comes to work product doctrine and, you know, issues under Covell where, you know, the judge faint quoted in Clark Hill, he quoted, Co he or she quoted Covell and said, you know, it's, if the advice sought is the accountants rather than the lawyers, it's not going to be under the attorney client privilege. So we want to make sure that, you know, the lawyers are really the ones who are dictating the form and format of those forensics reports. As Sarah and so well put it, once we decide what's going to actually be in the report. Um, a lot of forensics pro providers have their standard forms. Let's make sure we're the ones controlling the form and substance of those reports, not just following whatever you know, provider form that they have available. And also, once we get the report, if we're going to even turn anything over, let's make sure that we're tying that to the legal advice being provided. So make sure there's kind of a, a nexus between you know, what's in that forensics report and the counsel that we're providing to the client so we can you know, establish in good faith, hopefully, you know, that kind of nexus that Covell calls for. Um, and if we have a report, let's make sure we're throwing in some good facts. You know, when forensics write the report, they're just, it's a kitchen sink approach sometimes. Let's be surgical about it. And let's make sure that we're writing for the different audiences who may ultimately receive that report, whether it's plaintiff's counsel, uh, re regulators, customers, whatever. Let's throw in some good facts in there, right? If there are controls that we had in place that you know, were good things that may have precluded the breach from going and being worse than it was, let's, you know, let's consider putting that stuff in as well. And then you also have to think about the long-term uses of those reports. Uh, we see a lot of, you know, 
we get pulled into mergers and acquisitions, doing due diligence on target companies. And, you know, you got to think about all the potential uses, you know, down the road, including as far down as any potential future acquisition. Um, and, and then last, I'm sorry, Natasha, you, you threw a lot at me. I hope you don't <laughs> mind here. Um, on the two track question, you know, the, the latest opinions, the judges seem to kind of take the view that there automatically ought to be this, what they call an ordinary course investigation. So we need to think through, okay, if there's going to be one, um, who's going to be the, you know, who's going to do that ordinary course investigation? Is it the SOC and the, you know, the CSERT? Is it going to be a second forensics firm? Uh, you know, for a while we've been doing two-track investigations, primarily in the payment space where you have to automatically hire a PFI if there is a payments-related breach. So we've kind of, there's been two-track investigations for a while. Now it seems that in any kind of incident, we're having to consider those. And we need to think through who is that first course in the ordinary course investigation. Um, you know, it's got to be a full one. You know, Clark Hill suggests there almost has to be written documentation for the ordinary course investigation. You know, if the only report that gets created, as Kim was saying, was one of the two capturing the truth, as Kim put it, um, you know, we need to think through, you know, who's doing that ordinary course and documenting it so there is evidence. In fact, there was a second one so that our investigation and our external providers ha have protectable reports. So, sorry, I just threw a bunch at you. I know that's super helpful and I think there's a lot to say. I think um, there, there's a big reaction from the audience about um, the different types of reports that um, were the panel sort of recommending to prepare. So I'm gonna throw out um, just to anyone here, um, we have a question about um, can the same vendor prepare both reports, um, you know, whether one factual report looking, um, um, and then they're suggesting, we, we, but use two separate teams of people preparing them. Um, you know, so can, can someone sort of address this question? You know, do you have to have, um, can you have the same vendor preparing these different reports? Um, and there seems to be some, um, you know, practical advice that I think people are really asking about. Maybe I, I could jump in um, and I, some of these strategies and solutions start to get overly complicated too. Um, and this is a crisis situation. At the end of the day, you really want one set of facts. So on the two track investigation, as Todd mentioned, we sort of got that in our heads because it was a forced two track investigation for most of our payment card breaches when you have to bring in this external party. And we used to just have that external party, the PFI, but then we said, well, we want a bigger scope investigation. So we're gonna have two investigations, one privilege to protect the company. So two track investigations get really complicated really fast with different investigators, different facts, making sure they both have the same information, different purposes. Um, so putting that aside and getting back to the report, if you have one investigator, um, I mean, I still think you can have them write a report that's directed to legal, right? That has more than just, you know, a bare bones set of facts that occurred on the incident, because they're going to need to report on most of the systems that were impacted and whether data was accessed, whether it was just a system impact, whether recon on the system or actual data access. Lots and lots of information that is directed to legal to understand the legal obligations of the breach. But ultimately, at the same time, we need to have an expect because of all the external stakeholders, um, whether it's regulators, auditors, uh, business partners, everyone expects and is going to expect some basic facts of the incident. So I think it's possible for legal to create those basic, basic, basic set of facts like a executive summary that can be provided to external parties based on what the, the privileged forensic investigator did, um, but just not attributed to them, not with all the information. I know it gets into the subject matter issue, but I think there, I mean, as far as coming up with a practical solution, then you don't have one, you know, two different investigators and you don't have one investigator that's drafting two different non-privileged, non-privileged document, which can really be problematic, you start turning over that information from a work product and attorney-client privilege perspective. So I think just having sort of a basic set of core facts of attacker activity drafted from a more extensive report and provided to external parties um, is one way to minimize um, the risk of waiver and, and still accommodate all the parties that need information about the incident. That, that's a great point. I mean, the case law has shown that if you hand your report out like it's candy, that's going to be problematic. But there are ways, there, there are some limited disclosures, you know, joint defense, joint defense agreement type disclosures. You know, if you're going to disclose it internally to your IT, you know, send a cover email. Hey, we're sending this to you to verify the facts in the report. You know, it's, 
documented so it really does have the appearance of it is being prepared in anticipation of litigation like you know we've got this report where you know we're preparing for litigation we need to make sure that the facts is disc as disclosed by our forensics along with what your facts are you know that kind of thing these little emails you know are really communications are really important to, you know to create a paper trail that this was done in anticipation of litigation or for the provision of legal advice so it's really important I think some of these things kind of start at the very beginning of just, I guess, awareness. And we talk about the forensics provider and, and how, um, you know, there needs to be general awareness on when it sort of switches from a severity perspective where it's sort of normal course management of an incident to, you know, something that becomes, you know, potentially more, uh, you know, litigious further on down the road. I think good forensics providers, or at least if I were a corporate counsel, I would want to know, you know, from a process protocol perspective, are my providers that are working with IT and security, are they, do they have this general awareness that um, they'll know how to uh, manage information? A great example is um, some of my competitors here today also have large managed service capabilities that in many cases they're there uh, prior to the incident. And generally, you know, whether it's the MSA that they had in place or the pre-existing agreement, um, you know, generally you would want them to be aware that if it hits a certain severity level that, you know, we're going to try and build, you know, some level of an umbrella or council likely will to at least be aware of that. Uh, another kind of just quick pragmatic point about this, you know, in terms of just some of the, the operational aspects, I think it's just worth noting partly in the context of this is this information or just even the day-to-day, -day, you know, cybersecurity and IT operations, uh, just the integrity and confidentiality of this information um, isn't just over email anymore. Um, there's oftentimes other out-of-band communication platforms like a Slack or a Wicker, et cetera. And um, good forensics providers will know and will already be tightly integrated with uh, council like we have on the panel here today that, you know, they'll, they'll stray away from um, uh, sort of more uh, less factual um, discussions uh, in terms of solving the incident. But ultimately on the front end, I would just say um, corporate council would be mindful of however they're preparing for an incident, whoever their providers are, because it is a fact that increasingly um, there is existing relationships, whether it's Capital One or otherwise, uh, these mammoth organizations want to have some level of readiness. So they're going to have MSAs or agreements, make sure those agreements can adapt to uh, also engaging through counsel, and that they're aware that they're, there's going to hit a severity level um, where it, it stems the gap of just normal putting out a fire from a, an incident or, or that standpoint, but when it gets into, you know, this is a broader exposure, forensic providers, please don't put the word breach in your emails or communications internally or, or otherwise, leave that to the other experts here on the panel. Uh, but ultimately, I think it's just generally awareness integration that, you know, as these things mature from an incident perspective, that you're, you know, sort of protecting, um, you know, your client in that sense in terms of how you handle your business. Yeah, thanks, Luke. I think, you know, you're the, the non-lawyer on the panel. So coming from that sort of forensic non-legal perspective, um, I think, you know, it's important to understand kind of what kind of trends you're seeing. Um, and I think I, I do want to move also and talk a little bit more about, um, you know, international breaches, multi-jurisdictional investigations where privilege law sort of varies, you know, country by country. Some In some countries, um, the privilege isn't even recognized. And so, um, Kim, I think you're going to tackle this question. Um, can you tell, we have a lot of international people in the audience, a lot of questions about privilege in different countries. Um, can you tell us how some of the strategies that, that have been laid out by our panel here, um, you know, might change um, during a multi-jurisdictional overseas investigation? Yeah, well, I think they, they absolutely would. And you need to approach any multi-jurisdictional investigation by looking very closely at each country's 
uh, laws, regulations, guidance when it, you know when it comes to privilege. Um, you, you can have the best structure in place in the United States, and if that country doesn't recognize privilege, it's not not going to help you. And there are con- countries that don't recognize privilege. There's company. There's countries that don't recognize pr- you know privilege by in-house counsel, but you have a stronger argument if it's outside counsel. Um, and and so you really do need to when you have a multi-jurisdictional uh, investigation need to be aware of each jurisdiction's rules and regulations around privilege and adapt accordingly. It may be that you choose to run the investigation out of one country and sort of segment other countries' investigations from the U.S. investigation. Okay. Um, there's a number of, of strategies that you can that you can put into place, but. But of course, um, you know, if you want to think about some guiding principles, I would go back to, you know, outside counsel is generally more, you know, more preferred to to engage the the vendor, engaging the vendor under a very clear SOW, clear language, um, you know, that it's on behalf and and for rendering legal advice and in anticipation of of litigation. Those are some core principles that if privilege is, is, is recognized outside the United States, it usually is around litigation in you know, particular. Um, so just getting the structure set up and making sure the vendor's aware of the structure. I mean, those all sound fairly easy, but are all very challenging in a crisis situation, especially when you're dealing with um, you know, individuals outside the U.S. and various jurisdictions. So making sure you get that core team, a set of investigation ground rules, everyone understands the privilege nature of it, everyone's using the right, you know, headers um, and, and only communicating with the investigation team, getting the structure in place will help you the best you can in multi-jurisdictional investigations. Um, but then of course, you've got to look at the, the particular country and, 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 and the, the laws and regulations around privilege. Yeah, no, well said. I think um, preparation is key, the structure of the investigation. Um, I think it's particularly challenging in international investigations when, um, you know, the investigation started overseas, kind of lands in your lap in the U.S. You're, you know, contacted by in-house counsel or, um, you know, overseas, and um, you've got to sort of um, take it from there and and try to potentially restructure the investigation if you can. So um, definitely having these discussions beforehand is um, um, you know, key so that, so that you're sort of not reacting kind of on the spot. Um, I, I think, um, you know, let's move to sort of ultimately, um, how to provide information to third parties. Um, they're, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, in a, a cyber breach, you're going to have to disclose information to your insurance carriers, sometimes to regulators, your board. Um, And, you know, we talked about sort of providing different reports, but um, Siren, you know, well, give us a bit of a strategy here. Can you go into more depth, walk us through how to minimize waiving privilege um, when disclosing information to third parties? Todd talked about, you know, the subject matter waiver and other other waivers. So what should companies be thinking about um, when they're disclosing information to third parties and, and also at different times? It, well, it depends on the third party, obviously. Um, yeah. One common scenario is auditors um, who, who want information about the incident. The privilege analysis um, sort of varies on that depending on whether you're talking about attorney-client privilege information or work product. If it's work product, then it's only a waiver if you're if you're providing it to an adverse party and, and there's so the, there's, there's uh, courts are split on whether auditors count as adverse parties, but the b- bottom line is there is risk um, that, that anything you provide to an auditor uh, would be um, subject to discovery. So, you know, you, you want to keep disclosures narrowly tailored to what the auditor or any, any recipient actually needs. Uh, auditors are often, are often can be focused on impact on financial controls, may not even know all the aspects of the incident. You can provide information orally instead of writing um, to the extent that they'll agree to that. Um, you know, again, going back to what Kim was saying, it can be the lawyer providing the information um, based on input from the forensic uh, uh, vendor as opposed to just handing over the report. You know, sometimes they will insist on getting a report. One thing you can do is try to provide like a tear sheet version of the report, an executive summary level version or, or just a, one that's less detailed. Um, and often they'll be satisfied with that. Um, you know, if, if there is a need to provide materials that you uh, do consider to be work product protected, 
um, you know, inform them of that, that th this is, you consider this work product, uh, explain why, build a record so that if you need to have that privilege fight later down the road, um, you, you can, you know, have that, that documentation as, as, a, as defense your position. Another common situation of law enforcement, I, I tend to find privilege issues are not really as salient when you're dealing with law enforcement. They, they're, they're certainly not typically an adverse party in these situations. Um, and they often just, they often just want to get like the IOCs from you uh, and an explanation of, of the, the basic facts. There's, there's some situations, particularly with APT type attacks, where they're going to want to know the details of how they got in. Um, and again, it's not necessary to provide that in a particular form. You can provide that orally, possibly give them a tear sheet version of the report if you need to. But they're going to usually be cooperative with you and, and, and try to get the information they need without, you know, causing worries for you on the privilege front. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, Luke, I think, can you jump in here from your sort of non-legal forensic perspective? Um, and what are clients asking you to produce um, when disclosing information to regulators, other third parties? And, and I have a lot of questions here about insurers as well. So if you can address that, that'd be great. Okay, I'll do my best. Uh, I think Sarah hit the, you know, definitely the, the core points of it. Uh, so much more from my perspective is uh, verbal now in terms of all these parties, at least at the start. Uh, they have all of these third parties or um, other more independent components. Um, you know, agenda is not the right word, but they all kind of have different uh, stakes at play uh, to you know, bring whatever sort of confidences to the incident. Uh, auditors, Sarah covered it. You know, they generally want to know um, impact and financials. Was there some sort of aspect of access to financial systems or just um, integrity to the ledger or whatever's kind of reporting, tracking revenue? Um, in terms of other regulators and law enforcement, um, all of this again is going to be tightly integrated with, with council. Um, a, a really good forensics cyber response provider uh, would never engage with any of these parties without some level of interaction, game planning, working with counsel to create a very tight script to, you know, only kind of cover that which is necessary. There are times, though, uh, particularly with third parties, business partners, et cetera, where some sort of statement or um, brief executive summary Kim mentioned it. Um, the trend is just is literally very high level or short, short and sweet executive summary now. Um, it's actually oftentimes when I have a poll for like sort of more detailed report, oftentimes it's it's the internal IT or security folks that are looking to leverage that. Um, and um, candidly, I think they want to know improvement areas so they can fight for more budget um, at the end of the day. Uh, and make the improvements, you know, to, you know, prevent the next issue. Um, a big, you know, driver in all this, you mentioned it, Natasha, is, is, is insurance. Uh, again, you know, it's balanced because they're, they're often supporting some of the resources that are enabling a lot of these organizations to have a really high quality response. Um, and they want to know information to, I guess, I think generally know a few things. I don't want to speak on their behalf for the industry. Uh, but generally, we're asked about timeline because uh, I think that, you know, plays into, you know, the time and window of coverage to ensure that, you know, the incident is covered because we all know about dwell time. I think they want to know that the incident's been mitigated. Uh, so, you know, there's not a repeat or a, a much less likelihood um, of, of that type of issue. And, and assurance is that it's been mitigated. Um, you know, ensuring endpoint deployment or EDR is deployed or whatever the right tools. Insurers are really smart. You know, they they have a huge pull of intelligence about the types of incidents affecting their insurers at this stage of the game with most organizations on incident three, four, maybe even 5.0. Uh, so they, they know a little bit about the tools, the tactics that not just the forensics provider, but the, you know, counsel involved as well. That'll be working to... Um, you know, protect uh, all those things. But, you know, organizations should just be cautious too in terms of working with their counsel and not oversharing some of the language. If it's an inexperienced forensic provider, oftentimes they, use, they may use, it may ultimately be the same uh, or the right service, but the language, particularly remediation versus response, sometimes that's 
you know, not the common vernacular, um, or if it's an experienced forensics provider, they may not have worked with too many insurers before and use the wrong language that, you know, uh, subjects the client to maybe paying out of pocket. Whereas if they had just kind of figured out the semantics, work with counsel, make sure it's aligned with the policy, it was probably the right work that the client needed. But, you know, you just have to make sure there's alignment there to make sure, you know, the business side of the issue is, is covered as well. Yeah, and Luke, and all good points. Um, a lot of questions about um, just insurers in general. And I think um, I'll just comment that, uh, you know, when you're sharing information with um, your insurance company, you know, um, just making sure that you're still in the common interest privilege and, and that law can vary by state, um, you know, has a reservation of rights letter been issued. There's a host of issues, actually, it can get complicated quickly and checking that you're in that common interest is, um, will be really helpful in, in um, you know, determining you know, what to hand over and, um, you know, how to go from there. So and I think, um, Kim, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, joint defense agreements um, and in what circumstances those would be uh, appropriate um, if you'd add that to the recommended practices for sharing incident information with vendors or your business partners or other third parties. Yep, no, you, you, it's a great point. Um, and we've seen over time sort of an evolution of use of um, broader ability to use JDAs, joint defense agreements, um, more and more instances where um, the breached entity has a common interest in investigating the incident um, and evaluating applicable legal issues in relation to potential notifications, litigation, regulatory interest, interests with other parties, whether it's business partners, vendors, um, entities with which you share common infrastructure, you mentioned insurance carriers, depending on the situation, uh, whether a common interest may apply. But, but I, I mean, I certainly remember, you know, eight, 10 years ago, few and far between, maybe in some circumstances where it seemed like a JDA would, would be, be working, it would be a, a good um, thing to use. But increasingly more and more situations, even if we anticipate the interest may diverge, they often do diverge at some point, but at least at the outset, there is often a common interest in investigating an in incident with, with several other different types of parties. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it sounds like you think that um, this uh, practice of entering into joint defense agreements is becoming more accepted um, and seeing that more and more. So it hasn't been challenged yet, um, but exactly. uh, that's maybe that's why we're using it more and more. But I do think it, it's, it, it does seem to apply in more situations given common infrastructure you know, you know, cloud issues, you rarely have just an, an incident of one party anymore that involves, you know, investigating one party or one party system. So, yep. Great. Well, I think we're running out of time. I think we just have a few more minutes. Um, and, you know, when I look at the sort of 50 questions that are 30 questions, actually, that have come in, um, a lot of them around um, structure of the investigation um, and, you know, the, the statement of works, um, the different vendors and how to retain them. So um, hopefully we've answered some of them today. Um, and I know we're not be able to get to your specific questions. And sorry about that. I think our panelists are happy to to talk to you um, offline. So um, I think I just want to get go around um, to everyone, try to provide the, the audience with just a takeaway um, and what you see, you know, some of the major pitfalls are that um, occur during a cyber incident that um, you can leave everyone with. Sure. Todd, why don't you go first? Uh oh, uh, well, you know, some of my takeaways is, you know, a lot of this case law is really challenging us in terms of what the role of forensics is going to be. I mean, up till now, it's been containment, investigation, notification and remediation. And the case law is really shrinking that, where it's really purely investigation and maybe help with the notification phase. And so I think a lot of the pitfalls we're seeing or challenges we're seeing with this is, you know, being able to retain forensics providers who know a client's infrastructure and environment in advance to provide more effective, you know, um, assistance to a client when they've got an incident. So, you know, I'm hoping to see that there'll be a trend in the other direction with the, you know, the first few cases that Kim reported um, so that we really can maximize the effectiveness of forensics in a breach response scenario. 
Uh, but I think the challenge going to be going forward is trying to figure out what the right balance is between the role of internal resources, whether you go to track, and, and what the role of the, you know, the other forensics provider is, uh, given these, you know, these inherent um, uh, case law-based limitations. So that's going to be the challenge. Uh, Siren? Yeah, I would say there's so much focus on the vendor report, but at least the vendor report is uh, somewhat under control in the drafting of it. It's often the casual conversations between IT employees or incident response personnel that can cause the most problems down the road in litigation. Um, you know, so one role of the lawyer uh, is to train the incident response team at the outset on appropriate internal communications protocols and sensitize them to discovery risk and make them understand that even if it says attorney-client privilege on the, on the label, there's still a, a possibility that, that what they say can be discovered. So. You know, the, the, the discussions need to be as much as possible just about the facts, avoiding unnecessary commentary, avoiding speculation as much as possible. And, you know, wherever people are in doubt, consulting counsel about uh, how and, and, and uh, what to communicate. Um, but that can often be, to my mind, the, the greater litigation risk of it today. All right. Well, thank you. I've, I've been told Bruce is staring over my shoulder here. <laughs> we're out of time. I'm so sorry, Kim and Luke. Um, you guys were great. Um, and, uh, you know, clearly this was uh, such an incredible popular topic. Um, there's so much more to dig into. So i um, happy to talk offline. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Hey, panelists, great job. And thank you. Uh, it is a great topic. Do it two or three hour session on that next time. Um, great to see the uh, international participation on this event. Shout out to Brazil, Germany, London, Singapore, Australia, uh, and everyone else in the US and elsewhere. Uh, really appreciate everybody joining us. Our next session will be our first spotlight of the day. Uh, it'll be a conversation with the FBI. So please uh, join us at 1030. We'll be right back.